Um, so, so my question is, um, if there's degeneracy of the ground state, how can we truly be sure that there's not, um, that the entropy is zero when T equals zero? Yeah, so this is the most bizarre thing about quantum mechanics. There is only one ground state. The ground state is non-degenerate. If the ground state was degenerate, then that wouldn't be true. Excited states can have degeneracy. The ground state is unique. Only one set of wave functions, uh, wave numbers and all those things, quantum numbers. Huh. So another way of restating the second third law of thermodynamics is that there is one unique ground state for a given material. Huh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I know it sounds funky. And when you take 482, for those of you who are going to take it, hopefully many of you, you will be talking about quantum mechanics more. And quantum mechanics is one of those things which is always bizarre. The more you study it, the more bizarre it gets. That's what it is. For us, we will <clears throat> take it as setting a scale for entropy, that we set the scale for entropy to be zero at zero Kelvin. And this brings up an interesting point for discussion. There is a fundamental difference between entropy as a state function versus internal energy, enthalpy. Oh, I haven't shared my screen. And I've been... Let's do that. So there is a fundamental difference between the three state functions, uh, entropy, internal energy, and enthalpy, and soon we will be seeing some other ones, being that for entropy, it makes sense to talk about the absolute value of entropy. For internal energy and enthalpy, we always talk about change in internal energy or change in enthalpy the absolute value does not really make any sense. Even though we can calculate it, we don't care. What we care for is the difference in internal energy or enthalpy. So just, and, and in general, this, this applies to all energies. For energies, we don't care about where did we start measuring from. All energies are relative to each other. For example, if you drew a potential energy curve for a van der Waals gas or something that looks like this, if you draw another potential energy curve, where all you do is to scale it up by a certain amount and draw it like this, the physics is not going to change. These are the same potential energy curves as, as long as all points are lifted by the same amount. This is not true for entropy. And why is this not true for entropy? Because entropy, the third law of thermodynamics, actually comes and tells us that the entropy at zero Kelvin, zero Kelvin, is equal to zero. That's why entropy is actually has a scale also attached to it. It's important. You cannot just move the entropy up and down. And as Thomas was asking, the key reason for this, we are not really going inside the proofs for this, but you can kind of see where it comes from. If you look at the molecular definition, what we are saying is that omega, the number of ways of arranging the system at zero Kelvin, omega at absolute zero, is equal to one. There is only one way of arranging the system. And in quantum mechanics, this boils down to saying the, the ground state of a system is unique. And this is a strange concept. And I'm happy to discuss more about this separately with someone who is interested. But for now, if you just remember that we kind of set the scale for entropy to be zero at zero Kelvin. That's, that's okay. It, it's, if you don't want to get into why it happens, omega is the same as W, yeah. Omega is the same as W. It is, sometimes you will see the notation W, sometimes you will see the notation omega. It is the number of phase of arranging the system. So with that said, the last time we were talking about how to measure entropy. And why did we care about measuring entropy? The idea being is that if we have a reaction vessel, and then this reaction vessel, vessel we put in A and B, and we want to, and let's say whether we, we put some A and B, and let's say there is also some C plus D, and we want to figure out what way is the reaction going to proceed. Will the A and B react to give us more C and D, or will the C and D react to give us more A and B? This question in a thermally insulated vessel can be answered by looking at S C plus D, or actually SC 
plus SD minus SA minus SB. It's thermally insulated, so Clausius inequality tells us that dQ is equal to zero. So if you look at the sign of this, we know that the S system, <coughs> excuse me, more than equal to dQ by T, where this Q is not reversible, this is just some Q, is the, is the, is the condition for spontaneous change. If this, equality, if this was an equality, then the system would be in equilibrium and you would not have reaction proceeding in any, any one direction. So this is why it's important than if you could get a sense for entropy. And uh, in fact, chemical equilibrium, which is the central concept that many of you will take out of this semester, is all about figuring out these type of numbers and seeing it can tell you answer for example what is the what is the relative concentration of a b c d that will allow this to be true and this is the type of idea we are going to work through if this sounds a bit abstract the general framework i just uh, wrote down in this part don't worry it will become very clear over the few coming lectures for now let's just the message i want to take you want you to take from this is that being able to measure the change in entropy is very useful because we can tell whether a certain process is feasible or not. And the reason why this is practical is because entropy is a state function. That's why we went through all that proof because this is such an important part that I don't think I would be making a cardinal sin if I told you, if I didn't tell you third law of thermodynamics, if I just told you, well, entropy is some number, let's also worry about entropy only as per a scale. Let's only worry about the change in entropy. The errors wouldn't be that bad. But if I didn't really drive home that entropy is a state function, then we will be missing out on so many things. So that's super important to realize. And that's why we worked through that argument that why is entropy a state function. So, so how do we measure entropy? The way to measure entropy is to realize that ds is equal to delta q reversible by t. Therefore, s at some temperature t, f is equal to s of at temperature ti plus integral delta q reversible by T going from Ti to Tf. Here, delta Q reversible, it's reversible, so it's kind of nice, but still not very helpful because, well, you will have to do a reversible path and it will depend on different paths, which part do you take, blah, blah, blah. Here, we can take into account that we don't care which path was taken. Entropy is a state function. All reversible paths should give us the same value. So how about we consider a constant pressure reversible path? if it was a constant pressure reversible path, then we know that delta Q reversible is going to be change in enthalpy, which is going to be Cp dt. And remember, we could just write Cp dt here because it's a constant pressure process. If it was not a constant pressure process, we would have had that mu Cp dp term also. So we have delta Q is equal to Cp dt. Therefore, S of Tf, is equal to S of Ti plus Ti to Tf Cp dt by T. And it, all it needs is the measurement of the heat capacity. And you have to take my word on it because I'm a theorist, so I'm really bad at doing actual experiments. I can do experiments on supercomputers, not in labs. But heat capacity and easy measurement. At some point in your, I have actually measured it whenever an undergrad. It's not hard. You do it in things such as a bomb calorimeter or other forms of instrument. It's one of the most, it's one of the easiest measurements in thermodynamics. And you can do it through any process. It doesn't matter whether it's, your, it doesn't matter that you're caring about entropy. If you have a value of Cp, you can calculate the change in entropy due to temperature. So this is change in entropy due to temperature. And which, whose entropy are we talking about here? Is this entropy of the system or of the universe? This is entropy for some substance A. So remember, I uh, motivated all of this by talking about a chemical reaction. So here we have A, B, C, D. So we will be doing this treatment to A, B, C, D separately. <clears throat> yeah, so however, when we take something, let's say our substance A is iron and we take iron from some zero Kelvin, zero Kelvin, so our Ti is equal to zero Kelvin and our Tf is equal to 1000 Kelvin. 
this won't give us the complete change in entropy. Or let's make it even higher. Let's make this temperature as 5000 Kelvin. Why won't it give us the change in entropy? Any answers? Any idea? Going through a phase change? It's going to a phase change, right? Iron is going to many phase changes. At very high temperature, it's going to become liquid. At even higher temperature, even iron will become gas. But it's going to phase change. Iron for especially goes through many, many peculiar phase changes. And those of you who are from material science backgrounds must, I, I know there's at least a few material science students in the class must, should hopefully remember that by heart, what are the phases of iron. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't matter if you don't remember. The thing to keep in mind is that in general, any substance A will start from solid, it will then go to liquid, and at some temperature, it will go to gas. And even inside the solid, it can have, yeah, so there is a discussion going about which temperature to use. You're changing the temperature. The temperature inside is the temperature that you have. So Molly said you would integrate to get Cp ln Tf by Ti. Molly, you're right, except that here I have not uh, specified that Cp is independent of temperature, okay? Cp for most practical things is actually strongly dependent on temperature until you get to very high temperature. So I'll draw a schematic plot for Cp. It tends to look something like this. It starts at zero and then at very high temperature it tapers. This is a typical plot for Cp or Cv. Okay, so you will, you will you, and you can do experiments to figure that out. It always goes to zero. Again, that's quantum mechanics. It always goes to zero at zero temperature. And then it rises. It rises something like T cube. This you can derive rigorously, chem 687, not this semester. So these are called phase changes. And later we will be talking about what is exact definition of a phase. For now, it is just a way in which a form, uh, in, uh, a, a, a particular form of a substance. Even inside solid, you can have different phases. It could be face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic. It could be magnetic. It could be paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic. All sorts of phase changes can happen. Let's just take as an example solid, liquid, gas. So when this happens, let's say this one happens at some temperature T f, and uh, Let's say this one happens at some temperature Tb. Here Tf is short form for temperature of fusion. And this one is short form for temperature of boiling at which the liquid boils. So there's a question. So the equation does not account for entropy when the substance goes through phase change. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, you're absolutely correct. This does not account, I'm just copying what Noel wrote, for entropy change during phase change. So that needs to be accounted for. How do we do that? So the, most of these phase changes that we care for, they happen at a particular temperature, at a fixed temperature. The melting happens at a Tf. You could also have called it Tm. T melting doesn't matter. It's just a name. And the boiling happens at a Tb. And what you can measure at these temperatures is the change in enthalpy. So for example, liquid water going to vapor at 100 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere, the pressure is specified. So typically these things are measured as a change in enthalpy. And the general word that Atkins uses for it, and I will also use, is delta H with a trans. Trans here is short form for transition. At some transition temperature, you have delta H that is happening. So therefore, delta S trans is going to be this heat difference divided by that temperature. Here, there is no integral because it is happening at that very temperature. So this is going to be delta trans H divided by T transition, whatever temperature at which the temperature is happening. And this could apply for fusion. This could apply for boiling. You could apply this for any phase transition that the material is going through. If you're a material scientist and you care about iron, you would take into account this for all of the phase transitions that iron is undergoing. So with this, we can finally write down our entropy at the given temperature, S of T. This will be given by S of zero, 
which is zero as per third law of thermodynamics, right? So there would have been S of zero, which is equal to zero as per third law. So we don't even write that because that term is just zero. So it starts from zero to a fusion temperature Tf. And until then, you look at the heat capacity of the solid. So the thing to keep in mind, I'm gonna draw a plot in a moment for how heat capacities change with phase transition. Heat capacity of the solid as a function of temperature divided by temperature. And I'm gonna use the symbol T prime because here we have T on the left-hand side, just uh, index T prime. Then we get to our fusion temperature. There we are going to write delta fusion H divided by T fusion. Now we are in the liquid phase. In the liquid phase, we go from T fusion to T boiling. And this time we are going to have heat capacity of the liquid T prime, DT prime by T prime. Then we get to the vaporization temperature. Then we will have delta vape H by T vap, which is the vaporization temperature. And if you have further higher temperature, you go so on and so forth. And you can keep adding as many phases you have. So this is the idea. There is nothing profound here. All we have done is the process of going from solid to liquid melting. You're right, but you could have considered it in the opposite direction, right? Then you would have called it fusion. So are you gonna call it T fusion if it's one side or are you gonna call it T fusion if it's the other side? So we just go with T fusion. What is before the T prime in the second integral? Let me write it down clearly. Let's not skip through it. So S at a certain T is going to be, sorry for squeezing everything around there. So zero to T fusion. And it, it could be T fusion or T melting, whatever you want to call it. It's just a name. Heat capacity of the solid at the temperature T prime divided by T prime as you integrate T prime. Then you get to fusion temperature. So you have delta fusion H, which you need to measure Tf. Plus now you go from the fusion temperature to the boiling temperature Tb. And now you have Cp of liquid T prime. Now you have reached the boiling temperature. So you will have delta vaporization H by T boiling. And finally, you go from the boiling temperature, if your temp final temperature is high enough, are you showing this from solid to gas? No, this is, this one is solid. Then you went from solid to liquid. This one is liquid to gas. And then you finally go from liquid to gas. And then there is the final thing from TF to whatever temperature you have. No, it is for all three. It is from solid to liquid to gas. And finally, you have Cp of the gas at that temperature T prime, T T prime. So this is if T is more than T B. If T was less than T B, you want what is the subscript after L? Oh, where is the L? This looks like a very complicated formula, but it's really very simple. Which one? Where is L? Um, I was going to say, is the final temperature in the last um, from TB to T, would that just be specified by the problem? Or yeah, by like exactly. Exactly. If your problem is 5 Kelvin, then you're not going to go this far, probably. Does the process of sublimation cut out fusion? Very good question. That's a very good question, Devin. So sublimation cuts out fusion. But guess what? This is something we discussed in the past. If we have a solid going to gas, the change in entropy coming from solid going to gas can still be calculated in change in entropy going from solid to liquid and liquid to gas. So sublimation cuts out fusion, but if you can, this, this is a very good question. So if, even, if you, though, even though 
it cuts it out, but you want to calculate the entropy change in a substance as it sublimes, you can still use this formula. That's kind of amazing, right? That you can still use this formula. It's only because entropy is a state function, otherwise it wouldn't happen. So um, this is, I will probably give you a problem at some point to go through this, but this is, there is nothing complicated here. The thing to keep in mind is we have to separate out our process in different parts that we can deal with. If you cannot deal with the different parts, you could have an, a separate case where it's hard to go from solid to liquid, liquid to gas. You know, you can manipulate things around because S is a state function. And that's what we exploited over here. And uh, any more questions about this? And the reason we could do this here, we would have had a S at zero Kelvin that we just said third law of thermodynamics is S at zero Kelvin is zero. So our life was simple. And that's called the third law of thermodynamics, that the entropy of the ground state is zero. Another way of thinking about it is that any material, all materials become crystals at absolutely zero Kelvin, and there is only one unique crystalline form. And that's really quantum mechanics. That third law follows from Schrodinger equation. Those of you who have seen it or will see it later, Schrodinger equation can be written down as, written down as an eigenvalue equation that H psi is equal to E psi. And it has different solutions, E0, E1, E2. This one is the ground state solution, E0, which corresponds to a wave vector psi0, psi1, psi2. When these are the higher energy solutions and they can be degenerate, you can show mathematically that the ground state is non-degenerate. The, the lowest energy solution of this, you must have solved for eigenvalues at some point. So when you solve it, this is a matrix equation, Schrodinger equation, which you will see in 482. And when you solve this, you will see that the ground state is unique. You don't have degeneracy in the ground state. And that's what leads to third law of thermodynamics. For us, it's sufficient to remember that S at zero Kelvin is defined to be zero. Let's just leave it at that. And if, if you're interested, it was from quantum mechanics. Okay, good. So we will continue down the path that has been created for us by Clausius inequality. It, it, it's, it's my when I first studied thermodynamics, I found it to be very boring inequality, but over time it has become my uh, favorite inequality because it leads to a lot of things. So what we want to do now is to think about spontaneity in a general framework and introduce the notion of free energies. And next class, we will finally get to Maxwell equation, Maxwell relation. So the next homework will be released uh, Wednesday morning, 7 a.m., and it will have problems also on Maxwell relation. It will be due in a week. So consider a system in equilibrium with its surroundings at some temperature T. So we showed the criteria for spontaneous change in this system. Spontaneous really here means preferred direction of change. Spontaneous has nothing to do with time. Spontaneous doesn't mean it will happen right away. It still might take the age of the universe, even though it's spontaneous. So, yeah, just because it's spontaneous, you know, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna make a horrible joke. I should stop myself. So spontaneous change has nothing to do with time. And uh, we saw how to quantify the condition for spontaneous change for an isolated system. It was the delta S total of the system plus surrounding should be more than zero. That was our definition of second law of thermo, one of the statements of second law of thermodynamics. And equivalent to this, we saw Clausius inequality, which was nice because it said that ds should be more than equal to delta q by t. 
equal to here would mean reversible, spontaneous would be ds more than delta q by t. And the most amazing thing here was that this s was s of system. This q was heat given to the system. So it really allowed us to take a system specific view and stop worrying about the surroundings, which might be too complicated to deal with or figure out. So let's look at this under constant volume. What does this mean? Clausius inequality. under constant volume. Under constant volume, one moment, um, something's confusing me in my own notes. Yeah, so under constant volume, we have, and we are talking about strictly reversible change. Oh, my screen share stopped. So under constant volume, reversible change, we can say, that delta Q constant volume, the V here specifies constant volume, yeah, sorry about it, frozen, is equal to du, correct? The change in internal energy. Therefore, ds is now more than equal to du by t. This is a restatement for Clausius inequality under constant volume. Similarly, under constant pressure, Delta Q. No, why did I introduce this reversible change? That's that's so bad. Sorry about that. It's not. It doesn't have to be reversible. That's the beauty. It doesn't have to be reversible. Because we. Why doesn't it have to be reversible? Because du is equal to delta Q minus P dV, right? If it's constant volume, du is equal to delta Q. I mean, I'm I'm going back on all the thermodynamics I have taught you so far, and that's the most wonderful thing about du and delta Q. There was no reversible and irreversible when we wrote down first law of thermodynamics. Remember those happy days? It was just state function and path function. So under constant volume, these two things are equal because this is equal to zero. There is no reversible, irreversible business. And under constant pressure, delta QP is equal to dH. Therefore, dS is more than equal to dH by T. So, in other words, we have just rewritten our Clausius inequality in terms of, entirely in terms of state function under constant volume and under constant pressure. I find this to be quite interesting because, you know, we still had a cube dangling over here, which is something external that we have to figure out what is happening path to path. But again, now we have something which depends only on state functions and lo and behold, we can use all our wonderful things just like we can go through completely different paths and still come back and check our things. So this is a restatement of Clausius inequality under constant volume and under constant pressure. However, this restatement is so useful that people decided to introduce different terms to express these notions. And that brings us to the super important concepts, so I'll write it in red, of free energies. Some books don't call both of these at free energy. I'm going to call both of these at free energy because that's how I feel comfortable. The first one is called Helmholtz free energy. You can omit the free, you can just call it Helmholtz energy and I'm fine with that. Or, and the second one is called Gibbs free energy. I will first write down the definition, which is a bit annoying when someone just pulls a definition out of nowhere and then tell you why it matters. A is equal to U minus T S. 
g is equal to h minus ts those of you who are mathematically very inclined should notice that there is something related here to a trick in math called logarithmic transforms that's why they are defined like this i think i had mentioned this once back in the while that anytime we introduce a new state function it has the same form of taking some state function and subtracting or multiplying a product of two other state functions remember that's how we got h it was u plus pv now we have a is equal to u minus ts g is equal to h minus ts and once we do maxwell we will revisit and uh, see why maybe we'll see i don't want to go too much into logarithmic transform that is done in chem 684 you start by talking about logarithmic transforms which i might be teaching next no, I'm not teaching next fall. Oh, good. So <clears throat> why do these things matter? Let's go back to our constant volume. Let's, let's try to see where, why did we introduce these things? And it's a bit circular. I first wrote them down. And uh, so what we are going to show next is that at constant, temperature, what can we say about A? What can we say about change in A? At constant temperature, dA is given by du minus Tds minus SDT, right? I just used this formula. It's constant temperature. So dA is equal to du minus Tds. And dG, both of them at constant temperature, is equal to dh minus tds right again because sdt is equal to zero is equal to dh minus tds therefore at constant volume and temperature this condition that we wrote over here ds more than equal to du by t what did we have? We had the condition that TDS is more than equal to DU, right? For spontaneous change. That is directly related to this thing over here is exactly equivalent to writing that DA at constant temperature and volume is less than equal to zero. And at constant pressure and temperature, we had TDS more than equal to DH, which is completely equivalent to writing DG at constant temperature and pressure is less than equal to zero. In other words, we have rewritten our criteria for spontaneous change in terms of two new state functions that we introduced. Why are they state functions? Well, A is a difference of U, which is a state function, multiplied from T and S, both of which are state functions. Same for G, H is a state function, T and S are state functions. So A and G, both are state functions. And we have just shown that at constant volume and temperature, let me, yeah, at constant volume and temperature, Clausius inequality is equivalent to saying that TDS is more than equal to DU, which in turn is equivalent to saying that the change, that the, at constant volume and temperature, change is spontaneous if the Helmholtz free energy decreases. At constant pressure and temperature, change is spontaneous if Gibbs free energy decreases. And this is a super important fact, irrespective of whatever area you apply physical chemistry in. If you are considering a cell inside the body and you are interested in understanding whether the cell is going to transform into something else, if the cell is just floating around the volume inside the blood and it can, it's really uh, uh, undergoing some sort of constant pressure process where the blood is at a constant pressure, then in order to study change in the cell, you would think about so Gibbs energy. But let's say that the cell is on the surface of the skin where it's not really constant pressure, but it's kind of kept tight between two volumes. 
then you would be doing change in Helmholtz free energy. Same thing for a battery, depending on how you're operating your battery. So volume and pressure are two control parameters which we can occasionally control, frequently control in an experiment, or it gets controlled on its own. You know, if you're looking at a volcano and maybe the volcano is some tight space where the volume is limited. So your natural variable will be to look at the constant volume and temperature. Once the volcano has exploded and everything is out open to the atmosphere, and suddenly it's no longer a constant volume process. You have to switch your gears and think about the Gibbs free energy and not the Helmholtz free energy. So this is our first time introducing these two new state functions. We will take a bit of time in understanding them a bit better. Here, it looks like it was just mathematical jugglery. They actually carry no new information than the second law of thermodynamics. These things are just a restatement of a second law of thermodynamics, but they actually carry physical interpretation. Let's see what it is. The Helmholtz free energy physical interpretation is a bit easier to prove. And uh, so what, what do these things really mean? So physical interpretation of, and it's an energy. So remember I mentioned earlier today that for energies, it's always the change in energy that matters, unlike entropy. So physical interpretation of change in A, and then we will look at physical interpretation of change in G. A here is Helmholtz free energy. Now some books use different notations for A and G. You might see F is for Helmholtz free energy, and G, G is quite common, but the Helmholtz free energy, the notation sometimes, sometimes changes book to book. So what is the phasal interpretation? Um, I think it might be frozen. frozen. Yes, I am. I didn't write anything more than a line, so not too bad. Sorry about that. So physical interpretation of change in A, and I'll write down this statement and then I will prove it, that change in A is the maximum work obtainable from a system at constant T. So you have designed a system and you want to calculate it, if you operate it irreversibly, then the work would be maximum. What is this work? What is this maximum work that you can get out of this system? That is equal to change in A. Let's try to prove this. So how do we prove this? We have our Clausius inequality. Ds is equal to more than equal to delta Q by T. This is just Clausius. Therefore, T ds is more than equal to delta Q, which is du minus delta W. Therefore, du is less than equal to TDS plus delta W, or delta W is more than equal to du minus TDS. Now, remember, we are thinking about work obtainable from a system. So this is going to be negative. So work obtainable from a system in our notation is negative. Therefore, delta W max is equal to du minus TDS. And uh, we just showed here that DA is equal to DU minus TDS at constant T, right? We just proved this. So this is equal to DA T, change in Helmholtz free energy at constant temperature. Therefore, we just showed that delta W max, the change in work done from a system, the maximum work you can get out of a system. And this system could be a battery, it could be a muscle, it could be anything, is equal to the change in Helmholtz free energy of that system. 
if you see what is the change, what change is the system undergoing? It is changing from uh, state A to state B. And if you calculate the change in Helmholtz free energy during this, if it's happening at constant temperature, then that change in Helmholtz free energy tells you the maximum work you can get out of it, even if everything was, no, under reverse, under irreversible condition, this would be less than dA. Under irreversible condition, you would be able to get less work out of this. So the reversible to irreversible thing happened over, the reversibility happened over here. That's why we changed the inequality to equality. One important thing to keep in mind, we don't have a constant volume over here that kind of magically disappeared. Now, as we go next to physical interpretation, of change in G, the Gibbs free energy, I will write down the answer just like we wrote over here and then think about the proof. It's slightly different. For Gibbs free energy, the answer is that it, oh, let me write down this statement first, sorry. The mathematical statement. Change in G, just like A, is the maximum non-expansion work, non-expansion work obtainable from a system. This is, so already there are two differences. A was maximum work. It did not talk about expansion, non-expansion. Remember, just note here, we did not talk about PDV or anything. It was just work, overall work. It included everything. But for G, it is maximum non-expansion work. It, it, it doesn't tell you anything about the expansion work obtainable from a system at constant, T and constant P. That's kind of interesting. For A, we did not have constant P. For A, we had only constant T. But for G, we have constant T and constant P. So this is the physical interpretation of the change in G. No, that's the thing. Constant volume just doesn't show up. If it is constant volume for this one, okay, wonderful, you can use it but you don't have that requirement. And that's, that I find that always a bit strange, but that's how it is. A has only constant temperature, while G has constant temperature and pressure. Even though here for spontaneity, we define that DA, if you want, so let's see, there is a difference here. The main difference is coming for A. If the Helmholtz free energy is going down, then at constant temperature and volume, it tells you that the process is spontaneous. If the Gibbs free energy is going down, then at constant temperature and pressure, it tells you the process is spontaneous. Similarly, at constant temperature and pressure, the change in G is the maximum non-expansion work. But for A, if you want to build physical intuition for it, the constant volume condition does not even appear. The change in Helmholtz free energy tells you about the maximum work that you can get out of a system, even if constant volume is not playing a role in it. Constant volume is simply not needed in this. And that's, that's nice. So <clears throat> let's work through this one. It's a similar idea, similar type of proof. So we will look at our DG. DG is equal to D of H minus TS is equal to D of H minus TS is equal to DH minus TDS minus SDT is equal to DH minus TD. Uh, my pencil is a bit, Bluetooth is a bit weak, I don't know why. Is equal to DH minus TDS at constant T. We haven't yet talked about constant pressure. We just, is A related to expansion work or all work? A is all work. Mac, A is maximum work 
has nothing to do with expansion plus non-expansion. It includes both of them. And I will be showing you a practice problem for Atkins, which is solved in Atkins. So I'm not going to solve it here. And I will give you the number. I would like you to go through it. And this, these things will become clearer when you go through it. So this is equal to dh minus tds at constant t. Now h itself is u plus pv. Therefore dh is equal to du plus pdv plus vdp. Let's, let's go to the next page to do this. So we have, what do we have so far? I'll rewrite the key things. We have dg is equal to dh minus tds at constant t. And dh is equal to du plus pdv plus vdp. is equal to du no i don't want to write it that way i want to write it just like du plus d of pv let's just write it this way and now let's write down du as delta q plus delta w our first law of thermodynamics plus d of pv is equal to delta q yeah we will just leave dh over here and then we will use this let's call this equation one let's call this equation two use two in one to get dg is equal to dh now dh is equal to delta q plus delta w plus d of pv minus TDS, right? This is our DG. Again, we go and look at the reversible process because we are thinking about the maximum work. So for uh, reversible process, delta W, is equal to delta w reversible we just put in a subscript over here but dq is more interesting for a reversible process delta q sorry is equal to delta q reversible which we know for a reversible process is given by what's happening with my pencil it's just gone crazy Dock it again. is equal to TDS. I know it's a lot of algebra, but I want to finish it. So once you go through it, it, it makes sense. I, I want to finish it now. So and it will take just one more moment. So therefore, DG is equal to No, let's let's uh, let's not rush. We will we will start from here. We will we will start from this part in next class. Pencil is also acting up, and that's not a good sign. However, one thing I would like you to do is to go through this example. I have the number in Atkins. If you are unable to find it, I will post the problem. It's Atkins 3.d.1. It's a solved exercise. It talks about one mole of glucose is oxidized. And it wants you to use these properties that we showed for Helmholtz energy, I think, to calculate how much of the change can be extracted as heat, as work, so it will give you some intuition. Next class, we will start to talk about, again, finish this, what is the physical interpretation of G? And uh, the, and then we are ready to start our Maxwell relations next class. And I will have uh, office hour today at uh, 11, and I will, I will be leaving at 11.45. So 11 to 11.45, I will be there for office hour. See you all.